And we're back with the Costello Coaching Podcast. I'm Tommy Costello with dual PhD, Dr. Stephen Fru in psychology and theology. Today we're going to try our best to tap, tackle a concept that is probably too big to even attempt. But we're going to dive into trauma and try to understand how trauma interplays within the world of athletics and what to do with trauma, what to do with it. And so towards the end of this episode, you're going to hear some a model that Steven has worked on. So stay tuned to the whole episode and you're going to get a ton of value out of this one. Look, I think trauma is just such a tough word to tackle. And one way I feel like trauma is almost overhyped in terms of it's too big of a word to describe within sports. And then in another way, it's almost too small of a word to describe it. And I think trauma has so many uh, different ways of looking at it. When you say that word, you could think of so many different thoughts. Mm-hmm. Like at the maybe at the pinnacle of it, trauma could be associated with you know a really terrible experience, uh, a life and death situation. Uh, it was traumatic. Uh, you almost died, and uh, and that's trauma. But then it's like, wait, was something in your sports career career traumatic? It when you brought this topic to me, it just seemed almost too heavy for this. That's good. Maybe it is and maybe it isn't. I was a therapist for 20 years. And what happened during those 20 years was I would have, say, a example, woman in my office, 40 to 55 years old. And we would be doing the work, our marriage wasn't good or she was dealing with her weight or whatever she was dealing with, what we call her issues. And then one day in the session, we were talking about something, and I don't know how we got there, but she talked about having an abortion when she was 18. Now, that's 30 years earlier. 30 years. And I myself was a younger man. I was in my 30s or 40s. She talked, I started talking about having an I said, you had an abortion? And her eyes flooded. Now, as a young man, I didn't know much. I had my own tragedies. But I was surprised And when I've told women this, they were surprised that I was surprised. I was surprised at her deep emotional response to an event that happened 30 years earlier. So you consider that traumatic? I I think that's a way to describe that. That was a traumatic moment for her, and it has never gone away. Some things in life just never go away, though. Yeah. And then, and then the question, and this kind of why I wanted to kind of explore it with you because of your expertise in athletics, which is not my expertise, but you're, you have had your own physical traumas, your shoulder, your elbow, your, you've had your own stuff as well as personal stuff that you identify with. So, but you, if people look at the podcast, they say, look at that guy. He's pretty well put together. He's successful. He's out there in the world doing things. He's having fun. He's making money. He's, people come to him. So you say, well, has the trauma in any way undermined Tommy Costello's presence in this world? I would say it's probably made him wiser and more alert. But has he fully been able to work through those traumas, or has he just kind of compartmentalized them, put them off somewhere? You say, oh, yeah, you know, I... I I ripped out my shoulder in a car accident, and I was in the hospital for four months, and I almost died. But you know that happens to people. I mean, people talk that way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think for me, when you kind of bring that up, I think the work is in uncovering um, things that might have affected you without you realizing it. And I think in sports, you do uh, we do an incredible job of masking our challenges and – and working through the challenges because that's what we're taught to do and that's what you should do. Like I am a full believer in working through your challenges. But um, sometimes we'll, in order to, uh, the way I think about it is in sometimes in order to maybe win a battle or win a war, you're just going to throw a Band-Aid over a bullet wound. Exactly. And you'll continue to win the fight and it's not going to kill you. But it's like, oh my gosh, uh, you know, three months later, four months later, that Band-Aid that you put over it, now your arm's infected and you're going to have to amputate your arm. Yeah. And so for me... Beautiful analogy. Well, if it's if it's emotional, you know, if it's emotional scarring, uh, 
I think you need some help in in kind of figuring out what that stuff was. Yeah. And so that you can have a little foresight and intuition and see when that's coming next. And I think what happens is a lot of tragedies uh, or people could view them as traumatic experiences repeat in people's lives. These bad things keep on happening <laughs> because I really believe that they didn't really learn from them or have someone help uh, help them see what was happening or what kind of actions they were accepting in their life in order to make the changes in the future. And so for me, m going through my experience in sports, I feel my job as a coach is to fully understand what I really went through on every level. And, you know, I talk about the four components, and Tom House taught me those four components, but mental, emotional, functional fitness, biomechanical, and nutrition, sleep. Like, I got to do my best to understand all four of those components, where I did well, where I missed on, and kind of what the experience was. And when it comes to this mental, emotional stuff, I think that's the big work. Uh, because what I've seen is when people can tap into that and make some progress there, they can see the biggest results change for themselves. Okay, let's backpedal a little bit. I agree I, I agree with your philosophy there. I, I think you're good at it. Um, so I'm not wanting to jump over top, but I think we got a couple things going. I don't want to go too fast. There's yeah. a guy who wrote a book, Your Body Keeps the Score. His name is Vanderkolk. What great, a guy. What a great guy. Great book. And he's talking about what you're talking about and how trauma shows up in other ways that you would never have anticipated. For example, the athlete with the Band-Aid and or the soldier with the Band-Aid. He's, he's a courageous fellow, and he's going ahead with the job at hand. We've got to win the battle, win the game, whatever it is. We've agreed. We're a team, blah, blah, all that. All that's good. We all subscribe to it, say, right, right. Let's go. Let's go. However, he says... The consequences of trauma often show up in emotional isolation. We know they show up in various other forms of injury, like uh, high blood pressure or uh, stomach ulcers. Or There's a bunch of ways that things will show up that you can't directly trace to that Band-Aid on your arm. Nevertheless, the denial, because this brain wants us to thrive, and this brain, three components, remember the head brain, the heart brain, the gut brain, this brain is always observing what the neurological messages are and what the chemical messages are that are coming from the body. And, the, and, and it's saying, hey, wait, hey, wait. But what happens with the traumatized victim, the Band-Aid on the arm, he's saying, no, not now, no, not now. So the body is put in a, in a very difficult challenge. What do I pay attention to here? Do I pay attention to the wound and possibly get my whole team killed here in the battle? Or do I not pay attention to the wound and, and let my arm get infected and maybe ultimately gangrened and, and whatever, amputated? So he's saying, Vanderkolk is saying, your body keeps the score. You don't. Your body is telling you, hey, this happened. You want to you want to pay attention to it or not? If you don't, there are consequences. What else does he talk about in there? That obviously, like body trauma is is uh, I believe obvious, right? Like you get a physical injury, you feel it, you know it. Uh, you go through a certain amount of physical therapy, it recovers, you feel better. But what about the stuff that you can't really see? Well, don't you think? At, I, I I because I'm not, I, I never have been at the level of athletics that you are. I mean, I, I ran track, but, I mean, you coach and you've experienced a high level of success in pitching and so forth. Don't you think that there are some obvious things with in the athletic environment that kind of tell young men and young women uh, to disregard whatever symptoms they're experiencing? Yes and no. I Play hurt. Tommy's great, you know. He went out there and pitched that game. His shoulder was hurting. He did it anyway. We won the game. I mean, Tommy's tough, man. He did it. Yeah. That's a bad message and a good message. Yeah, I was going to say, like, it's tough. Like, I don't want to demonize that message. Yeah. 
because there's some goodness in, in pushing through some stuff and, yes. and overcoming it. Yes. And there's some dangers. It's yeah. like anything. It's uh, if it's uh, if it's gonna help you succeed, you almost gotta have a governor on it, right? Because sometimes we can overkill the things that help us succeed. You know. Um, so if you have an ability to push through an injury, say, and that's gonna help you succeed because you're gonna be out there more often than not. Uh, you're going to learn how to adapt and overcome. You're going to push through the adversity, and you're going to go win the game. Now you have more opportunities to go win the game because you have the ability to do that. The dangerous side of that is uh, injuring yourself further and really damaging yourself long term. Well, what about the athlete in his 40s that is discovering symptoms? He says, well, that's probably from. But he played through it. He went through college at a high level i mean maybe you play but good for him like that's that was might have been the best days of his life well if, if it's a short life they were yeah but sometimes but from this like, side of the room I, this guy might say well wait did you intend to live to 45 and then cash it all in yeah but sometimes it's like those are what why take away the best days of someone's life if and it's going to result in my having a head trauma that's going to make me dementia and uh, unable to when I get so depressed that I wind up blowing my head off with a pistol like the line yeah. famous linebacker Junior Sal did. It, 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 yes, I had a good life at SC. No, I didn't have a good life at 45. That's a value question, right? Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. like, what do, you, what do you want, right? Yes. And so I think but high achievers and people that are really going after it and really pushing – sometimes struggle to to accept that all right that was enough uh there's a, in a in a book named stillness is the key by ryan holiday there's a chapter called enough and there's a really famous story that he talks about earl woods tiger woods dad and the most devious word in the dictionary for them was the e word enough hmm. and it was because when tiger woods would go practice his dad would tell him hey all you have to say is enough and i'll stop picking on you and he would ruffle his keys in his pocket while tiger was trying to take a swing blow an air horn every once in a while curse him out when he when he missed a putt and he would just obliterate him his whole life to just build his mental resilience and on one end it worked right like you can't deny it 82 wins on the pga tour uh, goes down as probably the greatest golfer to ever walk the planet. And so, we, yeah, it's not healthy, right? And Tiger had other experiences in his life that everyone knows about. But their word was, if he said enough, that was demonized. And that he couldn't say that that was enough. He had to continue to push, continue to push, continue to push. And that's the problem, though, is sometimes we don't know when enough is enough. And that's when people get hurt. Well, yeah, not only hurt, but there's there's always other variations of that story, right? The man that has pushed and achieved great, great stuff winds up being maybe a womanizer, winds up being maybe there's famous stories in athletics. Mickey Mantle's one of them. Winds up being an alcoholic, winds up being dysfunctional in some way that nobody traces to how he was deny it in denial about what it took to get to where does it did. take that though to achieve at that level i question that, that's a question i'd ask you yeah i mean i i wonder that all the time yeah like if you're sane and competent can you even achieve at that level that's a good question i think can you even write that famous book that I want to write? If I am going to have a family, if I'm going to see my grandson on Saturday, if I'm going to, you know, say, well, that's enough for today. I'm going to go in and yeah, I watch believe... the news. Who knows? Yeah, it's weird. I, it's, you know, I, I think people, uh, I think people need to go through some trauma. <laughs> well, that's think... why these podcasts, I think, why I participate with you, because I think you're giving a real service to the people who are interested in this conversation. I really do. Yeah. I think it's a real valuable service because these things aren't talked about enough, in my opinion. No, and, and it's like is, if you're not willing to go through some hurt and go through some trauma and, and go through some pain, uh, don't expect you know these crazy results and high achievements because it seems like everyone that I've ever talked to that's achieving at a very high level has gone through some stuff. Yep. And it's not so much avoiding the stuff – as it is knowing how to work with the stuff. 
And people usually circle back. So they achieve, they achieve, they achieve. They got a little mess. And they're like, ah, I got to figure out a way to clean this up. Yep. And so I think if you go through life the whole time not trying to mess anything up and not go through any trauma and not go through any obstacles or not go through any pain, you're going to just live this get by life where you are never pushing yourself beyond to achieve things that you want to achieve. Like it's uncomfortable sometimes owning your own business and, uh, and having people rely on you for income and having, uh, you know, where you got to get out of bed and you got to go get the job done and you got to get it done or, or else like it's not going to work. And so I think having both is very, uh, unrealistic. So I think it's more, the conversation is more about how do you deal with trauma and how do you work with trauma rather than how do you avoid the trauma? Oh, I certainly agree, because you can avoid it for the most part. That's the abortion story. You can't, because she was 18 or 20 or whatever, and she was in the world that she was in. So, no, you're not going to get it by lecturing in the front of the room in her junior college class. You know, you're not going to get anywhere that way. She's going to get that lesson by going through that. And then the years are going to unfold as she has babies and she starts to appreciate the wonder of those babies and all of that. And she gets into a good relationship and so forth. And then she starts to remember and wonders, starts to wonder what could it have been like. I think that the Tiger Woods story is a good story like that. There's many other ones where the, 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 there's not enough conversation for the athlete about paying attention to your trauma. Your injury is your trauma. It's not just that you played hurt with that bruised arm or that bruised leg. It's it's that, call it something, and then deal with it somehow. You know, one of the things that I think is missed in trauma is the grief around trauma. It hurt, but the athlete doesn't get to say that, I don't think. Yeah, they don't. Yeah. Let's say, this really hurt. I hurt, and I'm afraid to get back on that field. I've got fear. I don't want to get hurt again. You know why they don't say that? Why don't they say that? Because there's so many people that want it. That if you're afraid or you don't want to, slide aside. we got a thousand people waiting. Uh-huh. Don't let the door hit you in the ass. Yep. Yeah. And it was interesting. Like, uh, not every day you get to say this, but I was talking to an astronaut today. <laughs> and uh, That's cool. Yeah, he, not every uh, day you get to say that. Yeah, That's not right. every get, day you get to say that. But I was talking to an astronaut this morning, and uh, he was an astronaut with NASA from '96 to 2014. Did two missions to the moon, or excuse me, uh, to space, and worked on uh, worked on the uh, telescope up there. I'm not I'm not a big space guy, but it was impressive nonetheless. The, the space right? station. Space station. Yeah, and so he. He was explaining his process, how many times he had to apply to become an astronaut. And he applied the first time, told him no. Applied the next time, told him no. And by the way, the, the, the credentials to apply are absurd. You know, you're a PhD in this, and you've done this, and you're physically fit, and you got all Applies the third time, fails. Applies the fourth time, they get him along excuse me, applies the third time. They kind of accept him halfway, but then you got to go through your physicals. Well, he wasn't 2020 vision. Like, failed him on eyesight. At the very end, very end, done. Somehow, he finds a way to go get someone to help him get his eyes stronger. And he goes the fourth time, applies. He passes the eye exam. They accept him. Uh, and, and then he ends up with 35 people in his class. It was the largest class NASA had. And... He, he's in there, and Neil Armstrong came to talk to him. And he said, this is an incredible opportunity that you guys have right now. You are fortunate. There's thousands of people with your credentials, and you were chosen. Be grateful for this opportunity, and this is a public service. Because they get sworn in as a government service like it, it's a government service that they're going to figure out what's going on in outer space right and and when i'm listening to that i'm like wow it reminded me of sports a whole bunch i'm sitting there thinking of guys the process they go through to get drafted in the mlb and i'm sitting there 
you know, they go through these applicants, and I have multiple guys going through this right now, that the amount of questionnaires that they have to fill out, the amount of physical exams that they have to take, all that stuff. Yeah. And there's thousands of people that want to go in and take those exams and want to get those questions yeah. asked, and only yeah. few get asked. Yeah. And then if you go there and you get there and you go, ah, I've had so much trauma with this. I, I'm not feeling that great about it. Well, we'll get you with this specialist, and your career's over. we got thousands more waiting to come in. And so to achieve at that level, to go to the moon, to go to space, to be an astronaut, to go to the MLB, to be one of the greatest players, to go to the NFL, to go to the NBA, these pinnacle levels of success that are both physical and mentally challenging, there's thousands of people wanting it and working for it. So the second that you put your hand up and claim that you're not emotionally available for it, they just move right along with you. And so what a lot of people do is they just cover it up uh, because they don't want to lose that opportunity. Right. They make they make a deal with the devil. Yep. That's a very important observation because, because the athlete that gets hurt makes a deal with the devil, I think you're saying. If he says to the coach, no, my right leg still hurts, coach isn't going to put him in, but he's, he might get traded. You know what guys do a lot of time, and I can relate? They just wouldn't go to the training room. So the training room is where you get a little treatment. And they, you know, like you go to physical therapy. Yeah. It's basically a physical therapist. You go to the training room, get some treatment. It's like frowned upon for some guys to go get treatment because what no no no, don't don't even let the the person who's supposed to help you with the physical injury know that you got something nagging That's you. That's right. That's right. They'll keep you out of the lineup. That's right. I did a I did a consultation for ministers a bunch of years ago. Traveled around the state of California and Nevada, meeting with ten to twenty ministers at a time. And the issue was they wanted to know why men were leaving their congregations and women weren't. And I said, kind of, this is simplification that the church is not for men; it's for women. It's a it's because it's rule based. What did they say to that? You had to dress up and wear yeah. a tie and everything like that. So we got into good conversations, right? So at noon, when we were having the rubber chicken and the and that circus, and the people brought, we we having our lunches, and always one or two of them say, "Can I talk to you privately?" Yeah. And I would get private with them, and they'd say, uh, "You know, I." I, I need to know that, that that I have a confidentiality agreement with you. And I would say, sure you do. Of course you do. And they would tell me there, usually it was about a, a, a relationship with a woman problem. So I'd say, you know, I know your denomination. That denomination invited me. They pay me. And I, I'm comfortable in that denomination at that time. Uh, you You have a couple of professional therapists in the denomination. To a man, they said, oh, we'd never go to him, just like you're saying. And, and I'd say, why not? Because it would be all over the place. Everybody would know. I can't afford that. And I can't afford private therapy because it's too expensive because I don't make that much as a minister. So I'm caught in this place. And say, I said, that's kind of a, a man issue in lots of places. The CEO has nobody to talk to. He's behind his sunglasses and his limousine. He don't have anybody to talk to about his loneliness. The high-performing quarterback doesn't have anybody to talk to about his leg or the pitcher or whoever, right? So it's a fundamental question for men. Your thing is the human inside the athlete. Probably a fundamental question in our families, probably something we repeat in lots of different places without really being attentive to it. We... Put this best face out there, best face forward kind of thing. So what would you say are some good tactics to uh, deal with trauma if you could give three bullet points? Well, I can have three bullet points because I developed a model of self-esteem that says awareness, encounter, disclosure leads to resolution of, of the self-issues that you're having. Now, awareness is the trauma awareness is to say to yourself honestly without BSing yourself I hurt my leg and it really hurts I had an abortion and it broke my heart I was afraid and blah blah or just to claiming it claiming it okay next and encounter is to follow that with okay that's true huh because that 
once you move into that space, you're open to some help. You're open to getting somebody on your in your tribe, somebody who's a helping agent, somebody who a therapist, a coach that you trust. You say, I got something here I really need to look at and talk about. So that's encounter. And disclosure is going into it. What really happened? What they do with PTSD in military. I not only was in Vietnam, I wasn't, not the, the soldier says, I, I not only was in Vietnam, but me and my unit, we killed 12 innocent people. We didn't mean to, but it was the situation. It was this and that, and we, we bombed the village or we shot the village. And he now is home and his hands shake at the dinner table, and he has wild nightmares, and he can't really reveal the depth of his emotions to his wife or his children. He lives in isolation, and he limps along. So this is the encounter. Pardon? That's the encounter phase. Yeah, yeah, and the disclosure phase takes him into that, and good people who deal with PTSD actually, not force, but bring him all the way back through the experience, reimagine it. Re so they can relive it and so you can deal. And so that's what's going on with my dreams. So you can grieve it. Yeah, that's what's going on with those dreams. So you can really get, say, wow, this is no little thing. And in fact, none of our experiences are little things. There was a family I knew in Houston. They had an eight-year-old girl, and she was having a lot of trouble in school. And I was at their house because I was there on business. And I was a business consultant. And there was a big poster size drawing on the dining room table and the father said look at this what do you think of this and it was a big oval shaped face very simple eight year old draw with very big I ears you me about this. and very big eyes and a little tiny mouth and I said you have about a year of psychotherapy inside that picture huh. right there because she heard everything saw everything couldn't, couldn't say, say anything, anything. anything. yeah so that's the thing yeah. right there. Are we done? You're, you're moving forward. I think we no. run out of time. No? No. Okay. What's the last thing? Okay. Well, you, was that it? So that was, that was awareness, encounter, and disclosure. disclosure. And then the fourth thing is resolution. because Where do you come to the resolution then? Well, because what happens when you're not resolved about the trauma, you're living in a dichotomy. You, you, have, those, you have the memory of the abortion or the blown out shoulder. But this other part of you is saying, put a Band-Aid on it. you got to go out there and pitch. So that you're in, you're in a, a, um, conflict with yourself, and you walk around in conflict. So your, your partner, your woman partner, say, or a male friend says, hey, what's going on? Ah, nothing. I'm just not too, feeling too good today. You blow it off. You blow it off. You blow it off. Resolution is about being able, not at that moment, but being able to go into it, re-experience it, reimagine it, and then possibly reimagine it in a more positive way. So you can come out the other side and you've grieved it and you have a sense of you in it that isn't demonizing yourself or blaming yourself or condemning yourself to hell because of that. I love that model. I love that model. Yeah. Yeah, it, it works. It yeah, works. it makes sense. Yeah. So you can do it, and, and then e even not, the smallest not to, things you can do it. And not to be long-winded on it, but the we've done a lot of work on dreams. Yes. We've done a lot of work on dreams. And the dreams where you get in-depth on your dreams, if you want to work on your dreams, I highly recommend it. It's been life-changing for me over the past year, is write down your dreams first thing in the morning. And you can laugh at them. You could wonder about them, but just write them down. And what you're going to be able to do is you're going to go inside them and you're going to connect some dots to what's going on in your inner world. Yes. And what Stephen coaches me on is your dreams are God's way of speaking to you. Yeah. And they're they're special. And the only way you get better at understanding your dreams is by being consistent with them and writing them down and understanding what's going on in your inner world. Well, you you know, it's fun in one way. It's very deep, what you're saying. To me, it's really life's work. But it's also fun in another sense. You say, who do I have to talk? I have today, Tuesday, I have maybe 8,000 experiences from the time I get out of bed to the time I crash at night. All different kinds. I drive my car. I thousands have, and thousands what, of thoughts. Thousands, right? So how do you get a hold of all of that experience? Dream captures it like a photo. It goes... 
It's like this. I'm riding a three-legged horse, and the horse is pink. What the hell does that mean? Well, it's there. It's kind of a summary experience. That's a simple p way of saying it. Yeah. But capturing those images expands your ability to use your imagination on behalf of yourself. Beautiful. Yeah. I think it's a great place to close it. Okay. Good. Now, this thing on trauma, by the way, folks, uh, you're listening to this podcast. This thing on trauma is much bigger than we were able to hit in this few minutes we had. So we will, I hope, revisit it because there's other dimensions that we can explore that will be very, very powerful. But that's up to Tommy because Tommy's pulling the levers on this and he'll decide whether we have time and whether we can do that. But that would be well worth following up on. Okay. Thanks, Great. Tommy. Yep.